Hello. Thank you for coming out to talk about what nobody wants to talk about. That seems to be always my themes of presentations. Like, let's talk about what no one ever wants to say. Uh, so first of all, um, I'd like to just let you know that I don't have any answers. So if you'd like to leave at this point, <laughs> you're free to do that. Um, I absolutely haven't figured any of this out. I've just been thinking about my own experience, thinking about the experience of my family as I've gone through my own cancer diagnosis, more and more friends that I know kind of going through it. And then um, one of the things that really surprised me when I was diagnosed with cancer was that even with all of the tools that I have, um, as a psychology professor, as a, like, I have tons of tools for anxiety, tons of tools for, you know, for stress, depression, and all of that. They were, um, I don't want to say they were useless, but they were not doing what I had hoped that they would do, you know? So, um, so I was just really started to think, okay, what really is going on with cancer? Is there something different about cancer than other long-term illnesses or other kinds of illness diagnoses? Um, what is, you know, what makes a cancer experience or, and I really kind of hate the word journey, but that the whole cancer sort of, um, sort of life different from, you know, from other, other things. Mary, oh my God. So this is my dad um, and his nurse um, way back in the way back in 1949, he was diagnosed with polio um, as a boy. And he, um, this was the poster for, he was the March of Dimes poster child. Um, at back in the, you know, back in the day, he obviously survived because I'm here. Um, he survived polio. He did have, um, he was, uh, unable to use his right leg. He was always, um, you know, he had the shoes with the lifts and things like that. Um, the polio ended up damaging his heart and nobody knew about that at the time. You know, this was pre-imaging and pre, you know, kind of all that sort of stuff. And he had an early heart attack in 1976. And then he had a second heart attack in 1987 when he died. And he died at 46. So he spent most of the reason I bring him in is because he spent most of his life dealing with illness. And so illness was was kind of the backdrop of our house in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I really missed when I was diagnosed with cancer, which was in 2017, I wanted to talk to somebody who had spent their whole life trying to figure out how did illness work? How do you, you know, and, and um, I don't know how much y'all know about polio, but it tends to come back like cancer. Like if you made it through the first time, um, something called post polio syndrome and the majority of the children who survived it the first time, if they lived long enough, the, the disease reactivated inside of them and they began to lose their mobility and um, other things like that. So in that way, it's similar to the fear of recurrence with cancer, which is certainly a very major part of, um, you know, of that experience. So he wrote lots of letters, and this is from one of the letters that he wrote. And this line really stood out for me because we were a family. We're a family that doesn't talk. Everything is fine. So of course, then you become the therapist in the family. Like everything is not fine. We must talk about things. <laughs> you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. So because we were this everything is fine family, um, when he would write things, and I would find these little gems that there was like something going on. It was really, really meaningful for me. And I'm sure that you can't read all of that handwriting, but the the big line that was impactful for me is, aside from a bad right leg and a few emotional scars, he goes on and on to talk about like how I survived this illness. I survived this this thing, and I'm like, huh? There were emotional scars. Like that would have been nice to have talked about. You know, I mean, like we saw it in other ways. We saw it in behavior. We saw it in, you know, some other kinds of things. But, you know, to know kind of what those were. And um, he lived, he was in an iron lung and he was in um, the hospital for um, almost two years between the ages of seven and nine. And all around him at that time, of course, children were dying because that was what was going on with polio. And no one knew really how it came to be, how it was how it was passed from person to person. So they were isolated and they were in basically in quarantine with polio. So that level of isolation and that level of death around you and that level of then body trauma, you know, I, I, obviously it impacted him. And because it impacted him, even before I had cancer, it impacted me, right? As part of that family dynamic and part of that family system. So in 19, uh, 19, in 2017, I got colon cancer. I probably got it a couple of years before that, but I didn't know I got it until uh, March of 2017. Um, I had a lower anterior resection where they took out about 14 inches of my colon. Um, 
So you can, there goes the bikinis. I don't know. I was like, <laughs> my, my life was ruined. Um, it was a complete surprise because of what was going on with my dad all of my life and because of my family history. Cancer was not even in the conversation. I was sure I would have a heart attack. Everyone dies of a heart attack. And <laughs> I'm like, that's going to be the way. There's not a cancer diagnosis in the family at all, except for mine. So it was a complete surprise. And when I began to have symptoms of it, um, which was about eight or nine months before I actually got the diagnosis, I ignored them. I was 45. There was no cancer in the family. It was like, ah, you know, finally I went to the, my primary care doctor and he's like, mm, you know, it's probably hemorrhoids. You're young. There's no cancer. Sir. There's no cancer in your family. Um, this was before they, they, I don't know if you know, they've lowered the age for colonoscopies now. It used to be 50 and they finally lowered it now to 45. Um, and part of that is because people are getting colon cancer at younger and younger ages. It used to be the, the, the disease of older folks, you know, and now, you know, people are, are diagnosed at stage four colon cancer when they're in their twenties and thirties, you know, it's, it's become, and they don't seem to know why, why it's impacting younger people so much now. So this completely was like, oh my God, like the first day of work I'd ever missed in my entire career as an adult was when this happened. And I had to miss six weeks of work because it's really hard to come to work when they're cutting open your gut. Um, but, I, but I would have come to work if I could have. So that was one of the patterns that getting a cancer diagnosis began to bring to my attention. It was like, oh, I'm willing to do anything if I have an obligation to do it, even with, even if, or even when, I don't feel like it's the best thing to be doing, right? So it called into question for me, like, okay, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? How much of what I'm doing is really valuable and in my best interest moving forward? What things need to change? So all these kind of questions, which were complete surprises to me, like in the beginning, it was a fight or flight for sure. Um, I got the excuse me, I got the diagnosis and within two weeks I was in surgery. So it went really fast and there was no way to really, you know, even process what that meant, what it was, you know, you don't know. Um, I'm guessing many of you here have had some experience with cancer, either yourself or in your family, but you don't know um, the stage often until they do the surgery and can check your lymph nodes and do all the other stuff, you know, unless it clearly has spread through other organs through a PET scan that they can see. You don't know. You don't know how bad it is. You're just like, okay, step one, we got to get this out. Okay, what does that look like? And then you have to wait longer to find out what they found out from all of that. And then you have more doctor's appointments and more stuff. And it was just really, 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 really destabilizing, as you can imagine. So this is a little, excuse me, a little raven that I drew when I was waiting for a CT scan. And this little raven began to be part of the memoir I ended up writing a couple of years later, um, A Constellation of Ghosts, after um, a lot of this had, had been put in the past. And this is one of my favorite quotes. It's, it really is from Confucius, not fake from Confucius. <laughs> I don't want to quote something. Or, you know, Lincoln said this. But, mm -mm. Um, we all have two lives. The second begins when we realize we have only one. And this was something that was really apparent to me with the cancer diagnosis. It was like, oh, okay, the time for playing around is over. Not that I actually thought I had been playing around and kind of wasting my life. I did not think that, but it was just, things came into some really intense clarity. Um, one thing that I think is unique or is, I guess, interesting about a cancer diagnosis is you become so much more aware of your mortality, but you're not special. Like everyone is mortal. You just become more aware of it. And that can either be a gift or a burden. But the ones who haven't had cancer are still also mortal, right? So it is that it can be easy to feel like I'm the one that's gonna die. I'm the one that has this thing. Everyone is gonna die and everyone is gonna have a thing. So, you know, that can be pretty, um, that was pretty useful for me to, to do a kind of a reframe like that. So I was a person who always had, I'm very focused, I'm very driven, I'm generally very calm. Um, and then all of a sudden anxiety kicked up and I had really never met anxiety. Um, I had met it through student writing, I had met it through you know, other people, but I really hadn't experienced it. It was always just really, I'm not just like a cat, just like I'm good, let me sleep, let me eat, we're good, it's all, it's, it's all okay. And then suddenly I felt like I was a hummingbird. 
was like everything was just so amped up and I was you know so concerned I was concerned about money because it costs a lot of money to have cancer it costs a lot of money to have cancer even with insurance um, and it's a never ending cost of money because you're really never not with doctors, even when things are better. You still have to go, like I, at this point anyway, I have to have a colonoscopy every three years um, and that will continue for the rest of my life unless it gets tighter than that, you know, because they find something. And that alone, you know, is about a four to $5,000 expense, depending on how your insurance deductible is, how all that is, you know, kind of going on. And that becomes a thing that you're like, well, do I not do that? Or do I, you know, because it was really expensive to have the surgery. The surgery was like four times my annual salary. Um, when you saw the bill, it wasn't like, I didn't have to pay the insurance. I had reached my, you know, my thing. But when you see the billing, you're like, oh my God, you know, and it, I was in the hospital for seven days. So I started thinking like, is this actually PTSD? We think about PTSD, of course, often with, um, with the military, the people who've seen you know, traumatic events on the battlefield. Um, but PTSD is really much more than that. Um, it is an anxiety disorder. That's a response to traumatic events, lasts more than 30 days and can't be attributed to other causes. Yeah. So that's your sort of technical definition. Um, so if you've witnessed, confronted, experienced death, or an integrity of the self, so like something that has changed how you view about yourself, can factor in there. Life-threatening illness is specifically one of the criteria laid out for potential PTSD diagnosis. Um, the stressors triggers what's this type of a subjective response, which means it's a feeling. So it isn't like um, something happens and I jump back. That's not subjective, that's objective. Something happens and I feel a thing. Sorry, I'm doing exactly what I said not to do. I'm stacking my chest. I think this might help. Were they both on? Yeah, that way. <laughs> Behold the voice from above. <laughs> so I have a feeling, I feel like I'm afraid, I feel like I'm alone, I don't know what to do. And then that begins to loop and begins to loop and it begins to spin. So some additional symptoms, and these are uh, paraphrased of course, but a re-experiencing of the trauma. So I can't, you, you can't get past the traumatic moment. So of course, in, in a military situation, we think about the moment that the the you know the bomb went off, or the moment that something terrible happened with your you know with your your friend in the in the vehicle next to yours. With a disease, it's okay. Is it the moment of diagnosis? Is that the trauma? Just just a question. Is that the moment? Is it when you really realized what the diagnosis meant? Is that the trauma? Is it the first results of the scan? Is that the trauma? Is it the surgery? Is that the trauma? Is it when you reach the six month mark and you don't know what's going on, is that the trauma? When you have to go back for your one year evaluation, is that the trauma? Like where did it kind of land? You know, because it does keep perpetuating over and over and over again. Um, Hyper arousal. So this is when we are, we respond in a way that's out of sync with the threat. So this can be, you know, um, hypervigilance. Um, it can be projecting lots of anger. It can be um, being really super cranky. It can be retreating from emotional experiences, some kind of reaction that's not in sync with what's actually happening. Um, do we avoid things? So with cancer, right? <laughs> the only way you like know you have it is when you go to the doctor. So what if we just don't go to the doctor? So my mom is like, I'm not going to the doctor. They're going to find something. And, and it's like, well, so the thing is there, whether someone finds it or not, that was, that was a, that was a reframe that I kept thinking about when I would get terrified to go back for follow-up scans because I was phenomenally terrified of follow-up scans because this was a test that I could not study for. I'm a very prepared person. If I know I have to take a test, I will study for it and I will freaking ace that test and it would be phenomenal. You cannot study for a scan. You can't like look at your body and be like, all right, tomorrow we're gonna be great. You know, <laughs> like you can, you can think about it and, and you can visualize things and you can, you know, but really you can't control it. And for a very, very, very good control freak, this was problematic. Um, so the doctor's office is often the beginning of when this event began to shape and form and, and inform your life. Um, if you feel like you don't want to go back to the place that's initially associated with the trauma, that's frankly normal. 
if you know if you had been attacked when you were out running you probably would not want to go running in that park anymore like that would that would be the event that would be the space you're like yeah no i don't need to go there but if you start avoiding the doctors if you start avoiding the follow up scans and the treatments that can can help you manage or maintain your disease then you're putting yourself in greater risk of the disease recurring and spreading and causing much more trouble. But you have to fight with yourself. It's like, I got to go in there. I'm not going in there. I got to go in there. I'm not going in there. Like I, um, I changed gastroenterologists because I could not go back in that building. It was nothing about the gastroenterologist. It was just, I could not go back in that building and sit in that room and look at that man again. I absolutely could not do it. But I knew I had to find a girl. You know, I knew I had to find one because you can't just walk in and say, I need a colonoscopy today. <laughs> they, they have to, you know, they have to refer you and do kind of, you know, all the stuff they have to do. So I had to find somebody new, but I could not enter that building. And it was to the point where I actually made my husband change gastroenterologist because I'm like, I cannot pick you up after your colonoscopy at that building. And because we're in a small town, there aren't a lot of them. <laughs> so it was, it was a little bit of a challenge, but I found one. Um, so if you look at serious illness as a component of PTSD, right, we talked about some of these potential trauma moments, the doctor appointment, the diagnosis date, the treatment that you might have undergone or the side effects of that treatment. Um, if you were part of a support group, when a support group member dies, that's a moment of re-traumatization. Um, the fear of recurrence never leaves. Um, so they don't even call it, you know, that you're cancer-free anymore, your call. It's no evidence of disease, which doesn't actually mean that there's no disease. It just means they can't find it. So it's a different, you know, it's like, okay, how often do I want to hear that? How often do I want to like, yeah, well, you know, I don't know. The test results and the waiting for new test results. When I was in the early couple of years of treatment, I was going to the lab about every two weeks to get blood work drawn. Um, and they were looking, of course, at white blood cell counts, um, but they were also looking at cancer markers. And, you know, because they um, they sent you your results from the lab, <laughs> you know, so you have access to them before your doctor does. So you would get this ding from Sonora Quest, like you have a test result. And it was always here. I would be at work and I'd be sitting. I'm like, oh, I got a test result. And I'm like, do I open it? Do I not open it? Do I want to know? What do I do? So I would make my husband open them because I didn't want to know. <laughs> and he would, but I did want to know. So Keith would open them and then he'd be like, it's okay. I'm like, okay. And then he kind of like, look, I mean, it was just like this terrified animal response to look at blood work because I knew if it was off, then I was going to have to do something else. And I really didn't want to do the something else. So again, it was the, the, I felt like I was fighting constantly the pull to bury my head in the sand and the pull to be realistic. That was like this constant source of tension. Like, can I just pretend, please? I really want to pretend that it isn't happening. And then also, I really want to be alive. It was a, it was a, a, it was the first time I had felt such, such, such conflicting tension within me, within my body. So I found some images that I thought were pretty cool about what happens to people with a cancer diagnosis. And of course, this is mostly from my own experience um, and talking with other people. But um, the first one I felt was like, well, where, where am I? Where am I? Who am I? What is this world? The whole world was different. My dad had been in the hospital most of his life in and out in various ways. So hospitals and that area, that world was at least familiar to me. I did not understand hospitals. I did not understand the language of hospitals. I did not understand the language of all the diagnostic codes. I did not understand the hierarchy of hospitals. Um, I, you can't sleep in them. They're horrible. They're like, they were this whole other space. And I like, I don't have any tools. I'm really good at navigating education systems. I've worked in education my entire life. I understand the codes in education. I understand how to get things done. Well, not done, but I understand that we should be able to have things happen. I understand how the system works. Not knowing how the system worked was very terrifying. Um, but more than just not where, knowing where I was within an environment, I didn't know where I was in my life. I get really through and pulled that into a different sphere. Like, okay. So I've been working at this job for close to 20 years. I've been teaching um, for even longer. I've been writing my whole life. I've been drawing. I've been doing things like, 
is this what I want? Like, if this is the end, you know, like if I'm going to die at 47, have I done what I want? Have I experienced what I want? Are the people who are in my life, the people that I want in my life? Um, and if not, what needs to be different? All those things really came to a head. And then there's this whole other world that you're in, which is the world of being sick. And this was very new to me. Um, with the exception of, you know, I showed you the, the surgery scars, but it isn't like I walked around <laughs> like that. So most people couldn't see. So I did not look like I was sick, um, except for, you know, just a week or so after surgery when I was a mess. But, you know, I looked basically like I look. And, but you're in this entirely different environment um, internally. Your body is doing all kinds of things that it didn't used to do. Um, so in my experience with colon cancer, that has completely changed um, that system for me. I was fortunate enough not to have to have an ostomy bag, but one of the things that they did do before I went into surgery was put the little dots on my belly and say, okay, here's where it'll go. And you're like, okay. Because then what are you going to do? They've got the <laughs> anesthesia right here that, you know, you got to go. And it's like, okay. And I'll go again. This is like within two weeks. But that doesn't mean that I didn't change a bunch of things around that particular system, which has impacted my life to this day. And we're going on almost seven years. So there are things I'm not able to do as well as I used to be able to do. I can't ever be very far from a bathroom. Um, I need to always kind of like, okay, can I, can I do this? Can we take a car trip for this long? Where can we stop? What can we do? Like, it's just, it's, it's ruled my life in a way that I was definitely not expecting, but then you kind of go back to, well, I have a life that it can rule. So how can we adjust to this change? It's not, you know, I didn't die. So, okay. But it, I didn't want to adjust like that. I wanted to always do what I've always done the way I've always done it. And that was not possible. And the more people I talk to with cancer and the more things I read about people with cancer, that's number one. I can't do what I used to be able to do and it's pissing me off. My life is different and it, I didn't choose this difference. So I really, really love this image. Um, and I don't mean that we don't have support, but no one goes in that MRI but you. No one goes in the PET scan but you. No one goes under anesthesia but you. No one wakes up in the middle of the night in the hospital room alone but you. And that's a different kind of, for me, that was a different kind of aloneness. I'm very comfortable being alone. My husband and I actually live in separate houses across the street from each other. Like I am totally good with solitude, but it was a very different kind of alone. And it was alone where I felt like um, I had none of the tools that worked. If we think like in terms of the hero's journey or story, all of the tools that I had in life A don't apply in life B. And there was this bridge and somehow someone forgot to give me the tools that were going to work for life B. And so in the beginning, you know, months or so of this, it was, I felt really, really alone. And I felt like I couldn't really talk to anyone because people would either, you know, either try to minimize with the best intentions or try to say things like, well, you look great or the surgery went well, or, you know, things that were certainly true, but didn't address the underlying fear of what had happened um, and what I was now, you know, kind of afraid was gonna, was gonna come next. And so I felt isolated in that place as well. And then I also felt like I could not, I felt not okay attending support groups or being involved in that because things did go okay. So it was like a different journey than someone who's a stage four and has, you know, six to seven or eight months to live. That is a different life experience than someone who got the diagnosis, went through surgery, had a year or two of treatment and challenges from that, but currently has no evidence of disease. Those are two very different places to be. So I was like, where exactly do I, there's some guilt, like I survived this, that was coming up as well, you know, for me. So physical anxiety, so the palpitating of your heart, your blood pressure increasing, shaking, um, not being able to sleep through the night, nightmares, um, things like that that can manifest in the physical body. This, of course, timed out really nicely for me with menopause. 
So it was really hard to distinguish what was menopause, not being able to sleep through the night, hot flashes, anxiety, existential despair, and then what was cancer, existential despair, not being able to sleep through the night, shakes. Da, 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 da. Um, the psychological anxiety, right? We've talked a lot about that already. What's next? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my family? Um, how much am I ever going to be able to not work? Do I always going to need to have money like in reserve for this next medical emergency that must be coming around the bend? It costs a lot of money, as you all know, in America to be ill. How much is enough? Or maybe if I have too much, maybe it's better to have none and then I can go on access, which seemed like the greatest deal ever <laughs> to be able to have that and have you know things paid for in a different way. And all of these questions were were impacting my psych my psychology. I wasn't able to focus, which was very, very, very new for me. I could not, I would read a page, I'd forget what I read. I would, you know, kind of just not be able to um to be really grounded wherever it was that I was. And then we have scanxiety, which is really a word, which is like the perfect word for what this is. Um, and this was like the perfect image for me for this too, because this reminds me of, um, you're going to like see the Oracle at Delphi to get your future told. You know, you're like, okay, I'm gonna go, hello, I wanna ask what's happening next. And there's this big creature and you really can't see the creature, but he's back there making all kinds of sounds and being all sort of all knowing. You can't prepare for it. You don't know what they're going to say. Whatever they say is going to change the rest of your life. So this trickles back again to me with, I don't have any control over this. Dang it. I really, really need to have control over this. How do I have control over something that I can't control? More internal tension, more internal conflict that contributes to anxiety, that contributed to the psychological and emotional distress. So skin anxiety is new, um, and I'm going to talk more about that a little bit toward the end, but it's a new kind of experience for us because it's new to have machines that can look inside of us. So it's kind of like carpal tunnel is a new physical illness. It's a new way we're moving our hands. It's a new way of repetitive motion that's causing people trouble. No one knew what was going on inside your body until you died and they cut you open for the vast majority of human evolution. So these machines, they weren't around when my dad was sick. They weren't around when he had his first heart attack. They were just, you know, so we've just got 30-ish years of this kind of technology that, that literally looks inside of you and finds stuff. So like you ever take your car to the mechanic and you know they're gonna find like $7,000 worth of stuff and it just has a ding. You're like, it's just making a sound. And they're like, oh, you need an entire, <laughs> you know? Like, I don't know that you should see that much inside of me. It's a neutral thing, it's a machine, right? But it certainly sounds like it has sentience. I don't know how many of you have been in an MRI machine, um, but they make this these clanging, you know, really primal noises, um, which I actually think are kind of cool, but they have it, but it's its own voice that the MRI machines have. So you can like, okay, are you my friend? Are you my foe? Is this your song that you're singing to me? Like what? What are you about and how are you communicating and why do you know stuff that I don't know? And then you leave the scan and you know they know because they just looked at it. Even though they're not the doctor, they're the tech, they know what they saw, they see it all day. And then they're just like, have a nice day. And you're like, you know, and you try to read their eyes you try to read the body language. You try to read. I had one guy when I was getting an ultrasound done. He was obviously very new. And he's, he, he made a gasp, <laughs> which is like worse when they, than when they say nothing. He made a gasp and he's like, do you know you have all this stuff on your gallbladder? And I didn't even know the gallbladder was like in play. <laughs> like I didn't know we were even looking at the gallbladder. And I'm like, well, hey, no. But he wasn't the doctor. It was a Friday. It's always a Friday. And so, you know, then Monday comes, you get the results and yes, there's stuff on my gallbladder, but apparently it's not a thing that it's not a thing, but he's, but all weekend there's stuff now on my gallbladder that nobody saw. All of the different machines are good at different things. So ultrasound is good at some things, a, a CT at some things, a PET scan at some things. So it isn't even like there's this master machine where you could just like see it all. 
oh, and there's x-rays, not great for cancer, but they, they do, you know, different, different things. I want a master machine. If we're going to do machines, I don't want to go through five different machines. But then they start scheduling these things every six months or depending on what your situation is, every three months, every, you know. And so you have to, your life gets condensed into three, six, 12 month blocks. And so then like for me, a phenomenally fascinating irrational thought that popped up was, oh, okay, that scan was clear. So now I have three months to the next one. But what if, if we had waited one more hour to get the scan, they would have seen the thing that just popped up. And it's irrational, but not. There's some minute where it pops up and becomes visible. Like it conceivably could have been if I had just scheduled that thing at 11 instead of at 10, you know, would have caught it. Now it's just spreading. <laughs> so, so these were just some of the things that just swirled and swirled and swirled and swirled in my head. And I wanted to talk about all of them with people because I think it's important that, that people feel like their experiences are normalized. And if you have similar thoughts, you know, you're not the only one that has had thoughts like this. So emotional anxiety, of course, is part of this. Um, and then there's a reconfiguring. Okay, what are the things I need to do now to move forward? And what needs to change? What people need to change? What kind of situations, you know, in work or in living or, you know, in hobbies or, you know, whatever, what needs to be different? Who am I now? Do the things that I used to love still apply? Do the things that I want to do still apply? So there certainly are also surprises and things that I did not expect to happen. Um, the level of clarity I had about what I needed to do in my life was very unexpected and very welcomed. Um, and we're getting very close to the playing out of the clarity from that time. And I did not expect that to be, you know, to be such a such an amazing thing. Um, I did not expect um, to have a completely different writing voice than I had had for the previous forty five years of my life. I'd been like it's been writing forever, and then that person that was writing books was not that person anymore, and I had to find a new way to write and to express who you know the things that I was feeling. But that turned out to be a great thing. It was an evolution of a voice. It was a different, you know, a different different place. I think it's important to also recognize that stress is not anxiety. So stress is a biological response. I mean, anxiety is a biological response too, but stress occurs to an, when we have an external threat. So when the threat is external, it's easy to say, like, oh, okay, that's what's happening. What's the action I need to take to address that? What change do I need to do to either relate to it differently or if I can't solve the problem, how do I reframe it? What's, you know, what's kind of going on? An external threat can be adapted to. Anxiety though is our specific internal reaction to that stress. And when anxiety becomes problematic, it's also, I mean, it's normal, but when it becomes problematic, like when we have generalized anxiety disorder or some of the other um, anxiety disorders that, um, that are so frequently diagnosed um, in our country, the anxiety is about situations that are not actually immediately threatening. So, or we can't find a source for it. So having anxiety about cancer, when there is, to the best of my knowledge, not any evidence of disease, means that there's a threat that isn't active. Like my house is about to flood. That's an active threat. I need to do something right now before, you know, before my house gets swallowed up. Now for sure, Cancer can come back for sure. I don't know what NED means because no one knows what NED means. Um, all of those things are, are going on, but it's not, it's very abstract and amorphous. I can't capture it like, oh, my, my car is making the sound. We'll fix the sound. And not being able to do that helps that anxiety persist because it can't be directly addressed. So I like to think of anxiety as future thinking paired with lived past experiences. So I'm worried about this next scan. People can say things that they think are helpful, like, well, your last scan was great, or you look great, or you're feeling good, or you haven't noticed anything. But in my head and in my body, I have a past lived experience 
which is our most powerful way to learn. I have a lived experience that says, this machine is gonna tell you I have cancer. I can't unlearn that, it happened. It's not a behavior pattern, it was an event. So I've got this past experience that is informing how I view all future interactions with that particular stressor, which is extraordinarily anxiety producing. And so it's different from, I'm worried I'm gonna get cancer when I've never had an experience with cancer. This is, I've had experience with cancer. You can't tell me there's no odds I'm gonna get it. Here are the odds, I actually have stats. <laughs> That, that will show you what the odds are of it coming back for me. Really different. So it's kind of like, this is one of those Chinese finger sticks that you, you can put on your finger and you, you kind of keep pulling at it. So you're, you're pushing at it and pushing at it and pushing at it, messing with it. And all it does is get tighter on your finger. The more you think about it, the more you spin around it, the tighter it grows and tighter it goes. And you just can't free yourself from it. I don't know if any of you suffer from the Google. <laughs> the Google is not an MD. I even had a sticky note. Google is not an MD, but it didn't stop me from Dr. Google. And um, the danger of being able to see all of your test results when you, are, when you yourself are not an actual MD is you don't know what all the words mean. So then you go looking up the words. And you really shouldn't be looking up some of the words out of context of the word, you know, they mean a lot of things, you know? So let me bring my 10th grade biology level to oncology and let me try to interpret my test results for you and then worry about it. Because again, always a Friday, can't call anybody, can't get any more information. Then you start like, oh, what does this mean? Well, what does this mean? And then you find studies you shouldn't find. And then you read the studies that you shouldn't read because you actually are not an oncologist and you don't have the level of education to understand the study. So you're trying to gain all of the information from the abstract because that's sort of in English. <laughs> and, and then you wanna call Nicole to explain the stats because she always says numbers of like, this is what this means. I'm like, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. What does it mean? Someone help me. But then because Google is the Google, it follows you. So once you've searched for something for the next five days, what are the signs of pancreatic cancer? How can we, here's hospice ads, here's, you know, so all of the searches that you've done trying to help yourself understand then becomes this like tiger over and over and over and over and over. So it's stalking you as you're trying to find out what you need and you can't forget and it keeps, you know, elevating your anxiety. And so hopefully, you know, I think we all kind of know there's a really strong correlation between what we think and what we feel. And I'm not saying we can think our cancer away, but if I think with these sorts of anxiety and spinning and you know irrational types of thoughts, that's going to create a heightened level of stress and anxiety. It just is. And I still don't have a concrete threat. I have a past threat, but not a current active threat. And so my body readjusts to a state of constant hyperarousal which does other fun things like increase your cholesterol, increase your blood pressure, increase your heart rate. Um, so I'm currently on blood pressure medication and heart medication that I am 100% sure is because of this, um, maybe menopause also, but <laughs> certainly some of, some of this because I'm like, I can't, I can't get this under control on my own. And I even felt, I felt actually a great deal of shame not being able to control it on my own look at these tools. I do know how to read these studies. This is part of my field. Like this is an area that I feel very comfortable in. And I couldn't, like, I should be able to, I should be strong enough to handle this. I should be strong enough to be able to lower my blood pressure through different food choices, through different exercise, like all of the things you're supposed to do. And I couldn't, I just couldn't. And so I've been on this medication now for about two months and shockingly it's helping. Um, and because it's helping, I'm feeling better, which is helping with, you know, with kind of, you know, other things, but I was surprised that I had such resistance to getting help for it as someone who spends half their days telling students, there is no shame in seeking mental health help that I felt shame in seeking mental health help. 
even, but I think I was able to do it because it was manifesting as physical. So I'm wildly qualified to be here doing my job. That's sort of, that's sort of the takeaway with that. Um, my therapist can only do so much. And it, you know, became this, this interesting, you know, this interesting sort of dance. So these are some of my favorite um, mind fucks. Hopefully YouTube won't pull the video for that. Um, the kinds of irrational assumptions that can pop up with a diagnosis. Um, and, and people are really, we're great about doing this to other people, by the way, you know, we're making, you know, cognitive biases about others. Well, you know, you smoked your whole life. We might not say it out loud, but we'll think things sometimes. Um, the country has a pretty long history of associating illness with poor character. So if you're sick, there's something wrong with you as a person. And we can trace this back, it goes on with illness and poverty back to the you know, early part of the 19th century, late part of the 18th century. Um, so I should have eaten more kale. Oh my God, I ate red meat. Right? Everyone knows I shouldn't eat red meat. Everyone knows I shouldn't, I ate processed meat. I grew up eating, we grew up without a lot of money. I grew up eating a lot of bologna. Clearly, I, you know, my mom killed me, <laughs> you know, trying to trying to feed me, like all of the things, right? And then, of course, this translates into an equally irrational assumption. If I eat more kale, I will never get sick or die, which is just as irrational. Um, mental filtering, when we're going to focus only on what's the most upsetting or negative parts of a situation, that's very common that can happen. Um, seeing things in a, in a real binary way. We're always this way or we're never this way rather than hanging out, you know, kind of in the gray in the unknown in the maybe um, something called overgeneralization. When we'll see this single event. So like this cancer diagnosis as everything being terrible and the proof that everything else is going to go terribly. So this connects to catastrophic thinking, emotional reasoning, so this is assuming that our feelings actually reflect what's going on. One thing that was fascinating about cancer is that I felt like I couldn't trust my body. And then I can't trust my thoughts. So now, yes, there were symptoms, but there were not symptoms until I am sure that that tumor had been there for several years, which means it was going on and I had no idea. That's kind of rude. And so why didn't I have any idea? Like, I did yoga. I actually did eat kale, you know, so like all of this, this like hmm, doesn't make any sense to me. Why is this happening? Um, so if you can't feel what's going on, that also can contribute to, oh my gosh, there's something going on that I don't know, that, you know, is happening. And then because you've doctor Googled everything and uh, colon cancer typically spreads to the liver and to the bones, um, if it's going to spread. So those cancers start popping up in your Google search feeds and, and Google stalks, you know? And so then you're like, my bone hurts today, right? <laughs> there it is, <laughs> there it is, this today's the day. You know, every little bump, every little, like my tooth hurt, my jaw, like everything. Every time you go for, you know, for a mammogram, every time you go for, you know, and they always find something, at least me, they always find something in a mammogram. It's, to assist, but I don't know that for six months because I have to follow up with it for six months and go through, you know, go through all of that over and over and over again. Um, taking the blame for things that are outside of your control. You know, this is my fault, right? Illness is not anyone's fault. Magnifying and minimizing events, um, not paying attention to things that are positive. So there's a big difference between toxic positivity and recognizing things that you can be grateful for and recognizing things that are going well. Jumping to conclusions. I did this all the time with Dr. Google and the scan results. You know, I'm like, I have 11 million degrees. I can make a conclusion about this. But the degree was, <laughs> again, not in oncology and not a medical degree. So not qualified, but I should be able to make this, you know, make this assumption. And it's always going to be a negative one for me. Um, the fortune telling one is also particularly powerful because I want to control everything. And this stems from my dad being sick so early in my life. I wanted to make sure we could control 
um, you know, his, his death or his illness or how I was going to take care of my mom, the family, all that kind of stuff. I learned patterns of, um, they're not effective, but I learned patterns that were helping me kind of keep control in a situation that didn't seem to, you know, didn't seem to make any sense. Um, so I want to try to decide what's going to happen ahead of time so I can prepare. So if I know, then I can prepare. So if I don't know, I'm going to make it up so that then I can prepare. And then I'm going to prepare a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Because you can really never have too many plans. <laughs> and then the thing doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen, or and or it doesn't happen like you thought, because no one can read anyone's mind, and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I made a lot of plans. And that took a lot of time, and that created a lot of anxiety. So anxiety can look like restlessness, um, being fatigued, having trouble concentrating, muscle tension, sleep, fear, um, fear of losing control, sadness, depression. Um, you know, we've looped in a lot of this already. Um, but back to the scanxiety, and I really kind of do love this dude. I, I named him George. I think it's useful to name the things that you're encountering. If you can name them and create a relationship with them, they're less terrifying. The name of the, the machine, it was a Da Vinci machine that did my abdominal surgery. The hospital, actually, they had named her Eva. Um, and when I, when they were, you know, when they were putting the dots on my belly for the oncology the, or the, um, the ostomy bag, they were like, I asked, does, does she have a name? And they're like, oh yeah, her name is Eva. And I'm like, yes, okay. Her name is Eva. And I'm with people who name a machine. So that seemed to make it feel a little more safe and not like she's lost her mind already, right? So, so with scanxiety, we're remembering what happened in the past and we're worried it's gonna happen again. That's actually normal. Um, but it, you know, it's not helpful. When you can't prepare and you're vulnerable, I'm also not a fan of being vulnerable. Um, when you think about um, abdominal surgery, I didn't, my husband watched, YouTube has all kinds of things. He watched the surgery, not mine, but he watched a surgery of this on YouTube. And apparently, and he didn't tell me until after, thankfully, but apparently you're, you're arched like this. So it's a sort of crucifixion like, and your belly is open. And then they take out your organs and they put them on a tray. And then they find the one they're doing and they take out what they're doing. And then they put your organs back. Now, thankfully he did not tell me any of that until it was over because I did not need to know that because I don't know, again, my non MD, I'm like, oh, they're just gonna go in like getting a tooth removed. <laughs> and it wasn't like that at all. But then your whole abdominal cavity is mad because it got all moved around and it got all upset. Um, so the scan has a great deal of power to dictate what's going to happen next in your life, which makes can make you feel pretty small. Um, if you approach the scan, it could tell you that you're cancer free, or it could tell you that you have a recurrence, or it could tell you that you have metastasis, or it could tell you all kinds of things. Um, so this kind of conflict is called an approach avoidance conflict. I have to go near this, but I don't want to. But, you know, if we delay these, right, we could have poorer prognosis. We could not catch things early. Um, you know, we all understand the earlier something is caught, the better the prognosis is going to be. But if we had never caught it, would it have gone away on its own? Because that's magical thinking really wants to get a foothold in there all the time. So this kind of modern malady is um, is really new and, and kind of fascinating. And I'll be interested to see more, um, more studies about this as it becomes more commonplace. Um, PSP is a real thing. It's called pre-scan psychosis. I'm seeing some recognition. <laughs> if we don't know what's gonna come next, we're nervous about the outcome. We don't wanna go. So I've had to keep telling myself over and over and over again that being afraid is not the same thing as being in danger. And that sounds like a hair to split, but 
but for me, it wasn't. For me, it was a really important distinction. Like, it's okay to still be afraid. It's normal to be afraid of being sick or of a recurrence or of dying. But at the moment, I am not actively in danger. I'm sitting in my house with my cat, right? So I had to keep kind of going back to right now, I am safe. I am here. I am, you know, to counter that, to kind of bring that fear back into proportion, um, so things that can pull you back in the present moment can be really helpful. Um, noticing where your body is, putting your feet firmly on the ground, noticing what your hand is touching, um, looking around and focusing on five things in the room that are not moving um, can be really helpful. Tapping your fingers, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, obviously breathing, using different kinds of breath work can be very helpful. Um, seeking out social engagement, um, but being really careful to find people who won't try to fix you. Um, or deflect or run away from your experiences, because that's just going to turn you then into the caregiver and create more avoidance behavior. Um, movement and exercise, you know, even just walking a little bit, getting up, changing position. You know, I mean, this can be, it's like you've got to interrupt the spin, right? So even if you just get up out of the couch and walk to another room, that interrupts for a second, right? Um, being able to release the pressure on yourself to always be positive all the time. I think sometimes we feel like we have to do that for other people. So pay attention in yourself if this is something that you're dealing with for avoidance behaviors that could impact your treatment or your potential outcome. So if one of them is scanxiety, which is so, 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 so common, can someone go with you? Can you arrange, and if no one can go with you, can you arrange like something fun afterwards, you know, so that I'm, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go to my favorite place for lunch. Or I'm going to do this and then, you know, whatever that that is to kind of help create a different pairing so that you're not just going to the scan and then going home and thinking about the scan and then trying to overthink the reaction of the tech who you know knows what happened. So we want to interrupt all of that. Notice your intrusive thoughts. Everybody has them to some degree, right? Notice what keeps popping up. If you can write them down, that starts to slow down their progression. Thoughts are just like fish. They just swim. They just kind of go, whoo, hello, I'm a thought. Um, but when anxiety is there, hello, I'm a thought, hello. I have caught my fish. I have caught my thought, and I will never let it go. Right? So if I don't ever let that thought go, I'm going to right? Contribute to my own anxiety. Write your thoughts down. Decide if they're rational or irrational. No judgment. Just is this, is this real? Is this not real? And then dispute them if you need to. That's basic cognitive behavior therapy approach. Look for moments where you might freeze your life until results are in. That's really, really common. I can't make any plans for this trip. I can't do this. I can't do X. I can't do Y till I know what's going to, you know, what's going to happen next. So you can fill that time in between with activities. Like if I knew I was getting a scan on a Friday, because it seemed to always be a Friday, I wanted to make sure that I had something to do both on Saturday and Sunday that got me out of the house. So I'm not out of the house. I visit Dr. Google, even with my sticky note that says, do not visit Dr. Google, Lorraine. I do because I don't believe myself. So cancer doesn't just affect us. This is the last little bit of the presentation. Certainly the folks that are around us and love us are impacted. And depending on the severity of the cancer or the type of treatment that a person goes through, this can be a multi-year or longer um, you know, event for the family members. Not only are, is someone that they love in trouble, is ill, is suffering, is struggling, whatever it is that they're feeling, they are also, their life has also changed and stopped in some ways and had to readjust. And if the diagnosis is terminal, then they're also grieving the loss of their person as their person is dying. And that's a tremendous amount of things going on. People will often not consider the caregiver. The focus is on the person who's ill and the caregiver gets moved to the background. The caregiver, man, the caregiver is everything. So if you're a caregiver or if you know someone who's a caregiver, take them out to lunch, right? Tell them like, this is amazing what you're doing. This is, you know, do you need a break? Can I help? Can I, you know, because that's a very particular kind of burden, um, there's, there can be additional responsibilities. So it's biological 
um, you know, like I couldn't, um, I couldn't drive for not for very long, but a period of time. Um, and so not being able to drive meant that someone else had to get my food. You know, I couldn't lift over 20 pounds. So someone had to vacuum, someone had to carry the cat litter, someone had to do, you know, again, not a very easy thing for a control freak to do, um, to allow someone else to help in that way. So your caregiver is, is taking in all of that. Their life can also freeze. Um, if the person is now out of work, so I didn't work, but I was, I was still paid because of family medical leave. So there was not a financial concern for us, fortunately, but that's not always the case. So then someone has to work double or all of a sudden, right, the bills just pile up, things become, you know, ridiculous um, in that way. Um, all of the time, we're forced to look at our own mortality and we're forced to face the possible death of someone that we love or our own death. Um, caregivers can also have their own unresolved griefs triggered. Grief is a cumulative experience, and most of us are not great at having processed grief as it occurs. So it provides a space, it provides a window for some of those um, unresolved experiences to bubble up that can create communication struggles between the, the, the person who is ill and the caregiver. Um, so I think that cancer anxiety is a, a little bit of a different animal than some of the other types of anxiety. The threat is in fact real, not an imagined threat. So you're not just, you know, if I'm afraid if I go outside, I'm going to be in an earthquake kind of thing. Like it's, it's something that has happened. So it's created that pattern for you. Um, the threat is internal and it's often very silent. Um, the threat is also though external. Your treatment can cause anxiety, can cause physical suffering. It can cause physical changes. You know, your hair can fall out. Your bones can lose their, you know, lose their strength. They're your, you know, all kinds of things. Your intestines don't work right. All kinds of things can happen. The threat is not predictable. No one's cancer is the same. That's one thing you learn very quickly that just because you have one type of cancer doesn't mean that anybody else on the planet who's had the same cancer as you actually had the same cancer as you. You know, if I broke my arm, pretty much everybody can agree how we should fix it. And it's not going to be much of a debate no matter where I go. Cancer, we have lots of opinions of, you know, different, you know, very valid opinions to different ways that that cancer can, can spread or be treated. Having that threat be silent is really powerful. Um, and the patient has to continue to revisit, if not the literal place of trauma, the, ex the experience or space of that trauma. So even though I could leave that gastroenterologist, I really, it's not in my best interest to leave a gastroenterologist. I need to keep having one. So that catch and release with our thoughts is useful. Oh, here's a thought. Hello, I've captured you. Are you real? Are you not real? How can I dispute what you're saying? Okay, bye. And then one thing that kind of brings a smile to my face is that everybody has existential dread, not just people with cancer or people who have gone through cancer. Existential dread is a part of being human. Um, we just got to play around with it in a different way and in an earlier kind of a way. Um, so grief counseling calls this the terror management theory. The idea that humans are terrified to die basically is terror management theory. We're afraid to die, so we'll do everything possible to pretend like we're not. And terror management theory gives us tools and techniques to help us face that mortality, but it's still very difficult. The mind doesn't know how to forget, I mean, how to um, imagine itself not being here. So um, cancer anxiety helps us make peace with mortality. It isn't about making peace with a scan. And that was a big distinction for me as well. And every human on the planet has to make some kind of peace with mortality. And again, that's what kind of took away that, oh, this isn't special, right? This isn't, it's, it can be um, It can be easy to kind of fall into why me, but that's a very useless question. You know, it's, why not me? Like, why am I so special that it shouldn't have happened to me? That's ridiculous. That's very arrogant. Like, why not me? Why not? Like, like the world, there's suffering in the world. Why should I not have had any, you know? That was helpful. That helped me like, oh, okay, you know? This wasn't like a punishment. It wasn't like a thing. It was just this, this happened because stuff happens. So cancer asks us these things. What are we going to do with our lives? Is what we've done so far meaningful? If I were to die soon, am I okay with that? How do you relate to your own extinction? And how will you live now that you know, not just intellectually, but emotionally and psychologically that you will die?
the humanities help? Art, music, books, philosophy, theater, um, they help us see how other people have lived with experiences, not just here's how you can fix something, but here's how you can continue to live and thrive and love. Finding meaning. So what choices can you make to be more in alignment with your heart? What do you need to say and what do you need to do? What can you continue to give? And how good are you at receiving what it is that you're able to receive? And these things can create what's called post-traumatic growth, which is basically here we are now in this new space. We're marked from the experience that we've gone through. We're scarred, sometimes physically scarred, but always as my dad wrote, some emotional scars. So something has happened and marked us as we've moved through life, but we've changed and that's okay. And we're still here. So what are we gonna do next? So thank you very much. Yeah, sure. We can do questions. Right. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Lorraine? Just wanted to ask. Oh, we have one question here. I've heard people talk about how their bodies have betrayed them. And I think, well, that's a very interesting way to look at a, right. a physical problem. Right, right, right. It was, you know, um, I didn't think that, I wished I had heard it sooner. I wish I had listened to what it was saying sooner because I did have symptoms when it probably would not have been as far along that I decided were fine. Um, so in that kind of line of thinking, I betrayed it. It's like, hello, you know, and I'm like, yeah, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> you know. Your body okay. wants to be alive. I keep going back to that. Like your body is your ally. It's your friend. It's a beautiful thing. It wants to live. It wants to help you. You said at the beginning that you really didn't care for the word journey. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I've used that word a lot for myself. People use year. it a lot and it doesn't bother me if other people do. It's not like, oh, they use that word. Um, for me, I think it, for me, it feels um, too pastel. Um, it, 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 but I'm dark. I just like to, <laughs> I just, if you've been to any of my talks, I'm always like, I don't think I, you know, I, um, and I also feel like it's a, it's a little overused and it doesn't really connect with, um, with the things that we tend not to say, like, like I've seen greeting cards, like, you know, good luck with your cancer journey. It's like, I'm not going to Paris, you know? <laughs> Like, so to me, it has a different kind of, just a different connotation for me. Hi, Lorraine. Hi. Um, you mentioned oftentimes people say the wrong things. Um, they're trying to comfort you or, oh, at least you survived or you're doing okay. You, um, what would have been helpful to you or even now? What's helpful? What can we as society, as people you encounter, people that care about you, um, should we say anything? Should we not say anything? Should we just be in the space? What's the right thing? Um, I, I do think that most of us understand that no one is, not no one, but people don't know a lot of what to say. And so there's going to be stumbles. I've said the wrong thing, you know, um, not just about cancer, but about grief. It's, it's hard. It's uncomfortable. Um, but some things that are very useful, frankly, are, hi, how are you? Like the real, how are you? Not the, hi, how are you? I'm on my way to a meeting. How are you? But the, hi, how are you? And then you like sit and, and, and can stay. The friend who can stay and not try to fix is the powerful friend. So um, other things that are, and not so much for me now because I'm in a different place, but um, you know how people will say, let me know if you need anything, right? And and they mean well, and half of them probably actually mean that if you know if you were to, but what that does is that puts the the burden on the person who is either grieving or ill to do the reaching out and tell you what, I need when I don't have any idea what I need. Cause this is a brand new, this is a brand new world for me. I don't know. So uh, alternative to that is, you know, I understand that this is a hard time for you. Here's what I can do. I can pick up your kids on Tuesday. I can pick up groceries for you. I can make a meal for you. I can, you know, whatever it is, these are the things I'm available to do. Are any of these helpful for you? I can mow your lawn. I can clean your, you know, so give people a choice. Here are the five things that I can do. Would any of these be useful for you right now? And if not right now, then later. That way, that person doesn't have to make yet another. There are so many decisions you have to make 
that are real decisions, not like, do I wear black or blue today? <laughs> like really real decisions that, that are kind of the no turning back kind of decisions that you are decision exhausted. So being able, like, I can help with this and then show up and actually help with that. Don't worry that we're gonna forget that we had cancer. Like, I don't wanna say anything because I don't wanna remind her. It's like, I remember, all right, every, every day, I actually remember. So you're not gonna make me feel bad by bringing it up. Genuinely asking how you're, how I'm, how I'm doing. Like I miss that because not that I think I need to be the center of everybody's universe, but, but in the beginning, it's much more, people are much more, you know, but once you're out of the medical system in a, in, in such an extreme way, you're kind of left like, uh, you know, you kind of were the center of the universe for a minute. Everybody had your, you like, all of this was going on. And then you're, you're just left and you, you, then I think is when a lot of the emotional stuff starts to show up because you've moved from I'm, I'm fighting or I'm, I'm afraid and I'm taking action and I'm doing all of this stuff to now like, okay, now it's quiet. Uh-oh. You know, and so then stuff comes up in that quiet that there wasn't space for when you were in a different kind of a fight to be alive. And so the two, three, four year down the road, you know, how has this impacted you or how are you feeling or what is different? Um, would would be validating.